Our next speaker Hi. comes to us from Romania. Long trip. Straight from the core developing team at OpenSips. Mr. Raz, Mr. Raz von Kronian. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? This one. Can you hear me, guys? Yep. Okay, cool. So, hi guys. Uh, as Alex said and reminded me, I'm Razvan Kraina. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the OpenSips core developer teams and part of the OpenSips solutions team. Um, and today I will be talking about OpenSips 3.0 and the stuff that we uh, built in order to ha make it better to use um, as entry points uh, for private networks. Um, we'll see a couple of network constraints that we might face in different uh, environments and how OpenSys behaves in this kind of um, private uh, networks and constraint uh, network. And we'll, I will show you the tools that we developed in 3.0 in order to overcome this, uh, these limitations. Well, first of all, why would you use OpenSys in a private network? That's probably because you don't really want to, but you have to. Um, you have to increase the security of your platform. Um, you don't really have enough public IPs in order to support the, I don't know, many numbers of open instances that uh, you might want to use. Or you might uh, run in a cloud or in private uh, networks, in, um, in VPN uh, networks, where uh, IP um, as, as assignment is uh, more or less limited. So basically you can do whatever you want in uh, those specific networks. Um, from OpenSIPS perspective, the imp uh, implementation first relies on OpenSIPS listeners. Basically a listener in OpenSIPS is uh, an interface that is bound to a network, a real network interface or to an IP, uh, a protocol and a port. and it's basically the interface that OpenSIPS listens for new traffic. Um, you can have as many uh, listeners or uh, as you want uh, for in OpenSIPS, but you will have to do uh, the management of traffic by yourself. So you'll have to say if one message comes on the public internet and you want to bridge it on the pr uh, private interface, then you'll have to explicitly do it in your script and we'll see later. You can use uh, the uh, multi-home uh, option of OpenSys, but that's not always, uh, that doesn't always work. Um, okay, so let's say this is a common topology when using OpenSys behind the, uh, in a private network. So you have here your ISP network, so this is something that you can control. This is your private network that uh, that you can control. This is where you have your media servers and all your, let's say, uh, feature um, feature features um, inside uh, behind the private network. And you want to secure this by placing open SIPs behind your public internet and your private network. And to do that, you define open SIPs with the public IP listener and the private IP listener. And as I said, all you have to do is detect if a, a message comes from the public IP, then you force and socket, you say, if the message comes this direction, I will use this specific listener to send it uh, uh, upstream. If there's a message coming this way, then I will send the public uh, IP to, to pass it further. So this is nice, it's easy to, uh, to, um, to implement, however, this doesn't really work, right? Because you want to implement high availability. Uh, I'm not getting into details what that means. I think Pete said enough, probably more than he should have. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, high availability basically means that whenever one of your server goes down, there's another, uh, there's somebody else that can take over that traffic so that you don't have downtime and stuff like that. And in order to do that, uh, you have to monitor exactly what's happening in your uh, in your platform. And a high availability topology looks something like this. So uh, instead of having a single OpenSIPS instance, you have two or more. You have to set up some sort of replication um, bit, uh, so that this guy can always be prepared in case this guy uh, goes down. And 
uh, we are no longer talking about public and private IPs. We have to talk about private and public uh, VIPs, virtual IPs, which is basically an IP that has to, that can move <coughs> between different uh, services. Uh, servers, sorry. Therefore, if this OpenSIPS goes down, this VIP, virtual IP, moves to, uh, to the, um, the different OpenSIPS instance and sessions will be uh, controlled by this, um, this instance. You still have to do, as I said earlier, monitoring. You can do that some, using something like Monit or uh, HA proxy. And you still have to do some sort of uh, VIP management. For example, you can use VRRP or Keep Alive. So that's basically vanilla flavor uh, high availability. What if some, uh, you are running in an environment that has network constraints? For example, cloud, cloud providers have their own uh, self-managed network infrastructure. Uh, there are a couple of cloud providers where floating or v, uh, virtual IPs are not available because, I don't know, they block multicast or even data centers that block multicast. So you really can set up a VRRP team to manage the VIP. Or there are cloud providers that are using their own high availability solution. For example, uh, in uh, AWS, we have the Elastic IP feature that uh, is somehow different. It works based on VRRP, but it's, uh, it's a bit different. So let's see how OpenSIPS behaves in this uh, kind of setups. Now, as you can see, we don't have a s just two layers of uh, networking. There are actually three layers. Is the ISP of the, of the cloud provider. Is the cloud uh, own uh, self-managed or internally managed network, and our local network that we uh, we can uh, we can use as we wish. However, due to the network constraints, we really can't have a VIP here, right? So we have to have two different IPs. Uh, it's the private IP one and private IP two. Let's say that for now, at least here, we can control our own network and we can have a VIP for the, for this uh, for this side. If this guy goes down, then uh, the flow will be something like this. Do you see a problem with this? The problem is that if this, if a call starts from here, everything will be fine, right? If this, if there's a call from this side, then we'll face some problems. Let's actually, this is a zoom in of this uh, scenario. So we have an invite here that reaches private IP one. We send it over down here, so the call is established. And in order to have high availability, we also have to replicate information about the dialog. So we say, well, this dialog has started from this contact, has passed through IP one, through private VIP, and here down to this uh, platform. When this guy receives this kind of message, he will say, who is IP one? I don't really know who IP1 is because he doesn't have any listeners. No one tells him um, that he should be listening or there, there is an IP1 that is involved in the call. So he will simply drop this packet. So that's, where, uh, that's why we invented or listed the listener tags that Pete already presented. So I am going to, be, to move a bit faster uh, for this. So it's basically built, uh, uh, it's used to alias different OpenSIPS instances mm -hmm. and say this interface is similar to uh, this IP on that, uh, on that OpenSIPS instance and so forth and so on. In terms of configuration, we've already seen that it's basically quite simple. You define the listener and you simply do tag and a name, a arbitrary name for the tag. Now, in our setup, we will assign to these two interfaces the tag pub uh, uh, label. Therefore, when uh, the message is replicated down here, OpenSys will see, well, I know who tag pub is. It's basically, it's my private IP too. So we are not, no longer exposing the private IP one, but rather I, uh, the tag which this instance knows is private IP2. Therefore, after this uh, instance goes down, the VIP is moved here, and we'll still need to do some, some sort of um, switching. So we have to instruct our uh, cloud provider that uh, uh, this, this public IP this floating IP or uh, uh, elastic IP is no longer pointing to this specific instance, but rather has moved here. So this is something that 
we should still be monitoring and in case uh, you know, when we want to trigger have, uh, the fallback, we have to instruct our cloud provider that we, he should move the IP. Of course, we need to move this IP as well, uh, but that's, that's the solution. But in this case, when the buy comes in, we will uh, send a proper buy further downstream to the, to the user. What about uh, environments where we can't use uh, virtual IPs uh, at all? So basically, we will end up with two different IPs with different, uh, different tags. The problem has already been uh, uh, exposed by Pete, so I'm not going to, uh, to enter into too many details. Basically, when we start a call, we will uh, replicate the, the information about contact and attack. However, this guy is not aware of the attack. So when this platform goes down, he will continue to send buys to this side, right? OK, what can we do in this situation? Well, this is where uh, 3.0 comes in. In 3.0, we've deploy, uh, developed a new uh, MI management uh, command that is used to trigger a sequential message or in dialogue messages. And you'll see that this, this is a very, very powerful command because it can achieve different purposes with a simple MI command. For example, you can manually trigger re-invite pings or updates. So there are cases when you don't really want to send pings periodically, like every 30 seconds and so on. You just want to send them when you know, I don't know, uh, um, a user might or has troubles with the network and you want to start uh, pinging that, uh, that dialogue. Or, for example, you can use the very same command to trigger, uh, to convert um, RTP-based DTMF to SIP-based DTMFs. So basically, you, you need a tool like RTP Proxy or RTP Engine that uh, detects DTMF and uh, converts them to SIP-based uh, SIP -based, uh, messages that are sent further <coughs> within the dialogue. Another thing, another very far, powerful thing that you can do, you can change, basically change an ongoing uh, media proxy or RTP proxy or RTP engine uh, in, within, um, during a call. So for example, if you have, actually, I'm not talking about that because I have a slide for that, <laughs> but it's very useful also for updating uh, the dialogue endpoints, which is exactly the problem that we had earlier. So let's see what we can do with this um, with this uh, solution. So we had the invite here. Okay, I think. Okay, now <laughs> uh, this this was supposed to appear early, uh, later. But anyways, so what we can do when we figure out that the this guy is down, so when we when this guy disappears, we detect this using a monitoring tool and trigger a reinvite downstream so we'll say this guy um, will send an update or or uh, an invite and he will this this instance this open systems will uh, use its own contact therefore this guy will say that for this call my next hop is now private ip2 is no longer private ip1 this means when he he decides to generate a buy he will send a buy here Again, there's no problem on this side because this, this guy already uh, has the ability to move the IP from this side to this side using certain, uh, using other, uh, other scripts like uh, the, the, cloud management, uh, the cloud management tool. Again, this was the slide that I was talking about earlier. So basically how RTP proxy go, uh, works, you get an invite, you ask RTP proxy for a, for a new SDP, you get back the new SDP that you will present to this guy, and from now on, the uh, the media session will will start like this. But what happens if, for example, this guy is to uh, gets to overloaded, or uh, what if it dies? Well, if it crashes, then there will be no media bridging. So basically, the call will not uh, will not have audio. 
When you manage to detect this, because for example, you are monitoring, uh, monitoring RTP proxy, you can start it or spawn a different instance, trigger a re-invite within OpenSIFs. OpenSIFs will, will generate an invite internally. You can catch it in the local route, engage RTP proxy for it. So basically ask a new RTP proxy set that's, uh, that's already um, available. It will answer. And then you will say send the second SDP that's received from the new RTP proxy down to this guy. You will get the 200 OK that you will forward down to this uh, to this um, instance because he also needs to to learn the new the new RTP proxy because the SDP has changed. And from now on, the RTP flows between these two using a new a different RTP proxy using again the same very same command is dlg send sequential um, so the the bottom line here the conclusions for this uh, for this talk is that you have to understand the limitations of your network because most of the time there are limitations um, you have to know whether or not you should uh, use listener tags or you can rely on plain uh, on plain VRP or uh, something that moves the IP from one instance to to the other. You have me sorry. You have means to update dialog endpoints inside the call, and also using uh, OpenSys 3.0, you can ensure media uh, RTP high availability using a sing all of these using a single command is DLG send sequential commands. So. Basically, that's that was uh, my my talk. I, I've I've moved a bit uh, faster because uh, some of the topics were already uh, discussed. If there are any questions regarding this, there's one over here. I think Alex is in his office. So, uh, so the dialogue has to be established for this to work, right? That's so correct. Have you considered ever uh, like uh, supporting mid-transaction uh, crash support? When the OpenSIP receives an invite, it manages to transfer something and it crashes. Um, yes, we did. That was the, the last year's presentation. No, I'm joking. The, uh, actually, I'm not joking. We did discuss about this, and we discussed this in the Anycast um, in the Anycast uh, discussion, uh, the problem is that transaction is very, very complicated. It, uh, it's huge in terms of data because the transaction basically means uh, invite and all the replies, not only return codes, you have codecs, vias, uh, record, record routes, all, all, <coughs> all this, um, all this information that is simple and everything it's timely, it's very timely, uh, uh, it's a currency has to be very, very good because for example, <coughs> if you just mix up like 404 with the two, two, uh, 200, then the call might be, uh, might be answered on one side but denied on the other side. So things are very, very sensitive when talking about transactions. So the only, let's say, good or acceptable solution that we managed to uh, to implement was using uh, any cast yes so basically that's the only let's say viable solution for ensuring transaction uh, fallbacks let's say and the last question what's the delay between uh, let's say for synchronization have you measured it based on the volume of the calls so it's immediately or it grows it's it's basically immediately, but uh, uh, because this all these let's say I, I have to go to the replication. This is done like almost synchronously, so basically you sometimes might not be able to send the invite unless you send the. So somehow it goes with the 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 way your entire open sips works. So this is this is sent synchronously. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, There's one over question. here. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage with TCP replication? With? 
uh, in case if you have a clients that are working over the TCP, how do you manage this uh, replication of the TCP sessions from one, one instance to another mm. one? Do you use a contract diamond or something else? No, we are, we are not. Uh, I mean, this is not something that we. So it's not support. No, it's no, it's not something that we took into account. But you, you can probably do it. For example, if your clients are implementing, uh, let's say, failover correctly, uh, when this TCP connection uh, is off because this instance dies, this guy should reconnect here and send an update or something that he changed his contact. He uh, he's because mostly lots of TCP clients just lose the in the session and it's not possible to Yes, if they don't reconnect you really can't reach this guy behind that. That it's basically I've been impossible. Struggling with it for quite a long time, so it's yeah. it's highly dependent on your endpoint because if it doesn't reconnect there's no one else who can reconnect. So you can't really do anything. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any other questions? We're done. So if there are no other questions, then we should uh, go down to lunch now, right? Okay, so... Um, Thank you, guys.